Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on Benjamin Franklin and his autobiography. So Ben Franklin, pretty well known, pretty popular person within American history and of course American literature. Born 1706, lived to 1790, which is to say he lived 84 years, uh, was one of the founding fathers and played various pivotal roles in the development and founding of the, Ameri of the United States. Uh, and has a lot to say for, or, or I should say, has a lot of accomplishments within his life. We can, you know, rebel, writer, editor, editor politician, inventor, philanthropist, activist, diplomat, businessman, ladies man, really a whole lot of things that he did within his life. He's a very productive and very intelligent person. He was largely self-taught. Um, he received he received some formal training, but largely was self-taught. And he really was, in, in many ways, he can be understood as the embodiment of the self-reliant man that we'll talk about when we get to Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, and his myth of rags to riches, and he seems to be the embodiment of that uh, other myth in American literature, which is, uh, or American culture, which is rags to riches. Uh, he was, I believe, the eighth. Uh, I, was it the eighth of some seventeen children in all had by his parents? Uh, so he was in. His parents weren't particularly wealthy, um, and having so many children, I clearly was not going to get any wealthier. So he really did have to go out on his own and, and forge his own um, success, which he did extremely well. Uh, he's on, but at his core Franklin is a is a representation or he's an embodiment of the Enlightenment and what I mean by that is he was constantly seeking truth, he was constantly seeking knowledge, he was constantly trying to push the boundaries of knowledge and understanding and we see that if you look at all those different roles that he played in his life, inventor, diplomat, businessman, uh, you really get a sense of what an enlightenment, what the enlightenment did was for somebody like Franklin, it pushed him to go beyond all the traditional boundaries. If he had been left to, you know, if he had followed the course that his father had set out for him, he wouldn't have done all the things that he did. But instead, through that seeking of knowledge and learning, he was able to do great things. And he, as I said, is the embodiment of the American narrative. That is, he goes from a very low standing to a very prominent standing throughout his life. Uh, he is able, you know, if, if we were to look at a list of his accomplishments, that in itself would take hours to cover because there was just so many of them, right? Even as an inventor, his list of inventions are, are substantial. The lightning rod, that rod on every building that, you know, when the, when the building is struck by lightning, grounds the lightning so that the building doesn't catch on fire, that was Ben Franklin. And what did Ben Franklin do with such a creation, with such an invention? He gave it away for free. He put it into the public domain saying, you know, this is something for the greater good. I want people to be able to have this so that people's lives aren't at stake in the safety of their homes. Uh, he was also one of the earlier writers um, within this within this genre that we know as autobiography. There's certainly other people that have written their autobiographies prior to him, but he's one of the most popular ones. It, he's one of the ones in which it becomes it's, we start to see some of the the genre conventions start to take place. Uh, and I think just because of the nature of it, you know, he's writing his autobiography for his uh, for his son. So his son learns the lessons that he um, that that Franklin himself had been exposed to. And what we see in so much of his work, whether it's in his writing here or elsewhere throughout his life, is that he's very methodical and, and he takes a scientific approach. And of course, this is just that, just that invoking the enlightenment. This is a, I will set to do these tasks and I will set to do them in this way. And if it does not work, then I will try this way, right? This idea of creating theses and, and then enacting on them and trying to work through to find out what is the real truth or what is the best way to do something. So, the autobiography itself has been, it has its own interesting publication history. Um, 
the first part of the biography, there's four parts to it, and the first part was actually um, published in France in 1791, and then in that same part was published in English in 1793. And part of the reason for that is just that Franklin's connection with France was substantial. He spent many years over in France um, negotiating relationships with the French in order to help uh, the American colonies gain support from the French in order to win the American Revolution. The first three parts were published in full together in 1818, which is nearly, uh, which is almost 30 years or 25 years after, uh, or 28 years after Franklin's death. And then the full text with parts one through four is published in 1868. So therein we see, you know, 78 years later, finally the full book. But the first few, you know, we have part one published and part and parts one through three published early on. Um, and you can see on the right is, you know, just a one of the earlier editions. This is the 1793 English version. On the right, that that image of the the front piece. So let's take a look at what this bi autobiography includes. Um, I just want to identify a couple different passages that I think are worth noting to help us think about Benjamin Franklin. There's a lot we could talk about with Benjamin Franklin. Uh, I think it's, you know, there's some really good documentaries out there that kind of give you a summation of his life, uh, but I just want to hit upon a few things that I found f that I think are important. Uh, the library afforded me the means of improvement by constant study, for which I set apart an hour or two each day and thus repaired in some degree the loss of learned of the learned education my father once intended for me. So what does Ben Franklin do? Ben Franklin goes to, you know, for long stretches of his life, of his early life, he goes to the library for one to two hours to read and just spend that time reading and learning and, and gathering more information. So he doesn't have formal education, but that doesn't keep him, that doesn't bar him from, you know, still seeking knowledge and still looking to improve his circumstance. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, as we talk about that American narrative, that rags to riches, that self-reliance, right, he does not allow those things that are denied to him to stop him from growing. Reading was the only amusement I allowed myself. I spent no time in taverns, games, or frolics of any kind, and my industry and my business continued as indefatigable as it was necessary. I from thence considered industry as a means of obtaining wealth and distinction, which encouraged me, though I did not think that I should ever literally stand before kings, which, however, since has happened. For I stood before five, and even had the honor of sitting down with one, the king of Denmark, for dinner. So, what we see here is Franklin, you know, he's setting up or he's informing his son um, of what he did in order to succeed. And so, you know, for him it was industry was the only means of obtaining wealth and distinction. And that's a, that, that seems to make sense today, but it, isn't, it didn't always make sense. Industry meant having to do a lot of work. It meant having to be, you know, a good thinker and all of that. And this is the 1700s. People are still inheriting wealth. People are still looking to marry into wealth. Uh, there's lots of other, you know, th there's lots of uh, other ways besides industry to acquire wealth. But Franklin is saying, no, this is the route I took. I took to reading, right? I only allowed myself to read. And if you think about reading as an amusement, it's absolutely fascinating. Much of our other amusement requires us giving something to get something besides time, right? So if you go to taverns, you got to buy drinks. If you're playing games, in that case, see, you know, you know or in, in any case, that would that would require, you know, buying the equipment or that would require owning or, or renting a space to play the game. And frolics of any kind, well, you can take that for what it is. But, um, you know, reading as entertainment even today is one of the few amusements in which you do not have to give anything to get anything or to get a lot rather, right? You can get a lot from reading in terms of entertainment, in terms of knowledge, but you don't have to give anything besides time. And in fact, for any entertainment, you have to give time, but for much of the rest of our entertainment, we have to give something, we have to pay in some degree. But the abundance of the written word means you could not have to pay for 
your reading, where you do have to pay for the other things. So here we have, you know, we have Franklin really talking about reading and industry as his means of success that eventually put him before kings. Uh, so again, and we understand that that's, that's again an American value of, you know, putting yourself to work, pulling yourself up by bootstraps to achieve success. I have been religiously educated as a Presbyterian, and though some of the dogmas of that persuasion, such as the eternal decrees of God, election, reprobation, etc., are to me unintelligible, others doubtful, and I early absented myself from the public assemblies of the sect, Sunday being my studying day. I never was without religious principles. Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, many of the people that are the founders of this country had been exposed to religion. They weren't necessarily religious, but as Franklin says, I was never without religious principles. Many of them were deists, and all that that means is they believe, a deist is somebody who believes there is a higher being, but does not necessarily believe you have to hop through all of the hoops that many denominations of Christians demand, right? Going to church, doing this, doing this sacrament, doing this, uh, you know, they saw that God did exist and they believed it was most likely a male God, um, but that he wasn't lording over every little move that was made. The goal was to have those religious principles and to help them to guide you, but they wouldn't be ones who believe that, you know, you should have the Ten Commandments in all public areas or, or things like that. They really they recognized that or they believed they were on their own to create a moral and a well-run world but not one in which is lorded over by Christian beliefs. I never doubted for an instant the existence of the deity that he made the world and govern it by his providence that, mo that the most acceptable service of God was the doing good to man, that our souls are immortal, and that will, all crime will be punished and virtual rewarded either here or after. So he's not saying that he doubts these things. He's not saying that, you know, there is a deity. And again, he uses the word deity, which imply, which is a direct call to, de to deitism, right? By, by saying deity and not God, he's saying, I'm of that strain of deism in which I believe you know there is that God there there is those big things happen but we are not under strict control these I esteem the essentials of every religion in being in being to be found in all religions we had in our country I respected them all though with deg different degrees of respect right and there's Franklin being witty, right? I respect them all, but different degrees of respect. I found them more or less mixed with other articles, which without any tendency to inspire, promote, or confirm morality, serve principally to divide us and make us unfriendly to one another. So here's where we get Franklin critical of religion, and as he says, you know, all of these things are in every religion. These are the essentials of every religion. But I find, or this is him saying that he found that a lot of these different religions and their specific articles, right, those specific elements of each individual denomination created more strife than they did the actual essentials of that religion, which is, of course, you know, the good deeds, which is, you know, be loving one another and stuff like that. So he's calling into question religion as an organization or the various religious organizations and the ways in which they create more strife in a lot of instances than they do actually peace and love. So later on in the biography, in the autobiography, um, he, we have Franklin set forward on this task that is completely out of the Enlightenment, right? He says, it was about this time that I conceived the bold and arduous project of arriving at moral perfection. I wished to live without committing any fault at any time. I would conquer all that either nat that, that either natural inclination, custom, or company might lead me to. This is an extremely extremely egocentric task or egotistical task, right? Franklin says, all right, I'm going to try and be morally perfect. And that is impossible to do. It is, you can aspire to it, and it's great to aspire to it, but to actually achieve it. 
But because he's this, you know, he is of the Enlightenment age, he believes in kind of being able to find a way, a path, the, the route to the knowledge, he believes he can do it. And of course he finds, as I knew or thought I knew what was right and wrong, I did not see why I might not always do the one and avoid the other. But I soon found I had undertaken a task of more difficulty than I imagined. While my care was employed in guarding against one fault, I was often surprised by another. Habit took the advantage of inattention. Inclination was sometimes too strong for reason. And I think we could all learn a lesson from from Ben Franklin. We are continually as individuals trying to be uh, trying to be as best as we can and yet we still make mistakes right we are trying to be a good student and then we mess up and we're a bad friend we are trying to be a you know a, a good person in charity and then you know we do so and we ignore our family needs um, we're constantly trying to be good in all the ways that we can be good and in doing so we often make mistakes I think this is a valuable lesson to be aware of, not just for ourselves, but for how we judge others. We so often, and I think that, you know, this is part of what Franklin is touching upon here, we so often are easy to judge a person. Oh, I can't believe that person did that. And we fixate on what they did wrong, but we don't actually consider in the larger picture, where was that person's focus? Was that person trying, you know, to do something else right? Or was focused somewhere else on doing right? I concluded at length that merely that the mere speculative conviction that it was our interest to be completely virtual was not sufficient to prevent our slipping, and that the contrary habit that the contrary habits must be broken and good ones acquired and established before we can acquire before we can have any dependency on a steady uniform rectitude of conduct. And so again, he's saying it, it has to be. It doesn't matter if you have the conviction or the interest to be complete, completely virtuous. It's not enough, right, that you're going to still slip and that those habits do need to be broken. Uh, you do need to replace them with good habits. But I don't, you know, I, I think he, he, there's also a degree here of saying you can try all of this. This is, a, this is a way to get there, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get there. In reality, there is perhaps no one of the natural passions so hard to subdue as pride. Disguise it, struggle with it, beat it down, stifle it, mortify as, it as much as one pleases, it is still alive, and will every now and then peep out and show itself. You will see it, perhaps often, in this history. For even if I could conceive that I had completely overcome it, I should probably be proud of my humility." So, you know, in his experiment, as he goes through this, and you'll find in the actual autobiography, if you read it, you know, he gives this, he starts to do charts, he starts to identify, here are all the sins, he, you know, I'm going to focus on these days. It's, it's really extensive. It's, it's pretty fabulous in that regard. But here he's saying, you know, at the end of the day, pride ends up being one of the hardest ones. Um, and we sometimes disguise pride as humility, as humility right? A lot of times, you know, people, whether they realize it or not, they're proud of their humility, um, or they act humi they act with humility even in a way that ultimately ends up being prideful. And that's what he's hinting at here at the end is, right, I, you know, I could conceive that I had completely overcome it. I should probably be proud of my humility, right? Look at how hum look at, look at me, I, I'm being, you know, I'm showing my humility, um, and just in that statement, you end up showing your pride. So he really does talk about the complexities of this and the challenges around this. All right, so that's some thoughts around Benjamin Franklin, around his autobiography. There is a lot more in there, and I would encourage you to kind of get into it and play around with it, because there's so much to be had there um, that it's worth, a, worth taking a look. But that's all for now. See you in the next lecture.